Now, as we looked at this particular letter, 1 Thessalonians, right through it, Paul keeps addressing them as brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. He's writing to people who we see from chapter 1, verse 1, are the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They're people who already belong to God. He's addressing them as brothers and sisters. They're part of God's family. They, they are the church, not just because they're socially gathered together in Thessalonica, but he's specifically speaking to them as members of God's family. So what he's going to say to them in the course of this letter will be particularly relevant to Christians. So if you're not sure whether you are a Christian or maybe know that you haven't taken that step yet, it's important that you don't hear me saying that these are things that you must do in order to be Christian. Rather, these are the natural and supernatural expression of life for people who have already become Christian. In particular, we're going to be talking significantly this afternoon about prayer. And there is a sense in which prayer is something which is open to everybody in the whole of this world. And it's the very process by which somebody can say yes to God's promises. They can call out to God and say, please forgive me. I'm sorry for treating you badly. I want to live for you from now on. And it's that process of prayer that's involved in somebody accepting God's offer of salvation. And then as somebody who accepts that offer of salvation, we enter into relationship with God, part of his family as brothers and sisters. And then what Paul has to say here and throughout this letter is how brothers and sisters ought to treat God, how they ought to live with each other what priorities they should have, how their conversation be, should be worked out, what are, what are significant things that are going on in church, and so on. So just to say, again, if you're not sure if you are a Christian or if you know that you are not, um, the, the first and most important thing for you to do as we talk about prayer tonight is to say to God, either please help me to understand the truth about you or if you think you know that truth and you haven't responded, to ask for his forgiveness. Put your trust in Jesus and ask him to help you to follow him from now on. Now, this letter is bookended by statements of grace. You see it there in verse 1, grace and peace to you. You see it down in the very last sentence, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now, I don't think it's simply a convention in how you should write letters. In the same way that I might go, you know, if it's a bit more formal, dear such and such, or if it's a bit more casual, maybe an email, um, hi, such and such. And then at the end, I might put cheers, Macca, or yours truly, David MacDonald, if I'm trying to get out of a, something I shouldn't have got into in the first place, or whatever it might be. Um, now, I think when he talks about grace, he is oozing grace. Grace is what it's all about. Grace is what he's received from God and what the Thessalonians have received from God and what should shape their relationships with each other. It's all of grace. Grace means that you've been treated well when you didn't deserve to be treated well. It's God's generosity and maybe you've heard this before, it's God's generosity or God's riches at Christ's expense. There's an acronym for you, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. And Paul's reminding them of that in the very first sentence of the letter and the very last sentence of the letter. It's all about God's grace. And how does God's grace enable us? Well, he calls on God's people to respond in prayer just as he has been doing for them. So let's have a look at what he has to say. First of all, in verse 18, we read there that it's God's will that we should pray. In verse 16 to 18, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
I take it that applies to the three imperatives that have come before it. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. That's what God wants from his people. Let's have a look at each one. He says, first of all, rejoice always. To rejoice always is a fundamental understanding that God is at work for our good in everything that goes on. Um, it's, it's not simply talking about an emotion, somebody who's always optimistic and happy and bubbly and extroverted, somebody who's joyful. It's speaking about an outlook on life that enables us to understand, to appreciate deeply that God is at work and he's doing good things. And that's something that doesn't come about naturally. It comes about by the work of the Spirit of God. And we saw that in the very first chapter in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1 and verse 6. He says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. See, they're copying it for becoming Christian and they welcome it. How can they do that? Well, because God's spirit has given them joy. That is, I take it God's spirit has enabled them to see the great gift of God in the midst of their suffering, to give them perspective and focus on, on what's truly happening here. Because we can be so blinkered, can't we? We, we can look at our circumstances and the circumstances can be tough and, and we can be led into pessimism and despair, thinking, God, please get me out of this. And yet maybe in the midst of what you're going through, God is enabling you to count it as joy because he's producing something worthwhile. In fact, James says that in the beginning of his letter. I'm going to jump around a little bit tonight, just looking at a few other passages in the New Testament. But in James chapter 1, we get this perspective. Let me read to you from verses 2 through to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters... Whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now that sounds twisted, doesn't it? Like, consider it joy, pure joy, when you go through a hard time. Why would you say that? Because, he says, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So when you realise what's happening, when God enables you to have perspective on even the tough times... You can be joyful. Now, I've been down to the medical centre down there in Lake Cat. I three times over the last two months uh, to see the dentist. And he's worked on the same tooth three times. He's drilled out all of the nerves. He's filled all the nerves in with antibiotic type stuff. And then he's packed those nerve spaces, those nerve canals, with something and uh, a little bit later, I'm going to get the bill for all of that. Now, why would I go through such severe suffering? The bill, I mean. No, sorry, the, uh, the drill and all of that sort of thing. Why? Because I know it's producing a good outcome. I'll stop having all these infections through this tooth. I'll stop having the pain that comes with that. I know that I need to endure these things en route because God is producing something substantial and eternal. And so I can be joyful in going through difficult circumstances. And that is the perspective I think that Paul gives them. And so they can be joyful always. It's not just the attitude here, though. It actually says rejoice always. It's to express the joy, I take it. Similarly, in um, Philippians chapter 4, he says rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Actually acknowledge God and what God's doing appreciating the fact that he's at work even through, and through the tough times and circumstances. Secondly, he says, be prayerful all the time. Uh, it's, it's tricky to, uh, I think some of the translations on this one have said pray continually, uh, or the NIV says that, um, and, and some have been led to think that that means something or other that you just keep doing all the time and you never stop doing. And so they would speak about prayer, therefore, as being kind of like an attitude of something that's happening all the time. But prayer, the actual word for prayer here, means to petition. 
It means to request. It means to ask. And what he's saying is, is not always be in a, a mindset of asking. He's just saying, keep asking for things because God is the provider. God is the sovereign giver of good gifts. So keep asking him for what you need. And when you think about Jesus' model of prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, it's a series of requests. God, make your name holy. God, deliver me from evil. God, give me today my daily bread. You see, it's, it's dependence upon God. And that's kind of fitting for people who are dependent on God. We need God. We owe God everything. We, we depend upon him for life, for breath, for everything. Things we eat, the shelter, the work, to work through those relationships, to grow together in him. We are dependent upon God and so we should be prayerful all the time. The word here for prayer, as I said, is literally to petition God. Now on the table over there, I have a sheet where I'd like you to sign the prayer. Uh, sorry, to sign the petition. Uh, it's a petition about an overpass at the end of Houston Mitchell Drive so that people can be safe as they go across the highway and we can avoid some of the catastrophic, even fatal incidents that have happened over the last few years. But it's that kind of word that Paul's using. Not that if, if you get 10,000 people praying the same thing, then then God must listen to it. Like 10,000 signatures means that the New South Wales government must listen to that petition. But it is asking God to be at work and that's a good thing to do. I know sometimes Christians get critiqued and they think, look, your prayers, you're just always asking for things. Yeah, well, God's the provider. He's the generous giver. And it's not just that we are uh, asking for things without reference to what God has already given and promises to give notice the third thing there to be thankful in all circumstances now I do think it's important to read this verse carefully to be thankful in all circumstances the preposition in is important it doesn't say to be thankful for all circumstances you see I don't think if you come across a, a serious car accident you should immediately thank God that there's been a serious car accident. If, if you suffer a, a, a really serious diagnosis in your life, I don't think that you immediately ought to thank God for that diagnosis. But as you focus on God and look at those circumstances, you will discover that you can thank God in those circumstances because God is at work in all things. God, the sovereign God, is at work to make us more like Jesus, it says in Romans 8, verse 28 and 29. We can thank God in all circumstances because God hasn't left us. He hasn't removed himself. He is at work in all these things. And so in a context that Paul's writing to Christians who are enduring some, some measure of suffering, they are copying it from their community, and as you see throughout the New Testament, there are times when Christians endure serious cost, even the cost of their lives. They're able to thank God because he is at work in all circumstances. So a couple of things to say there as we, as we tie up this. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. And notice he says all, 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 always, all the time, all circumstances. Prayer is to be a feature of our relationship with God in every context, in every situation, to be prayerful. Well, Paul's not asking us to do anything that he's not prepared to do himself. And one of the other themes that's come through this letter has been talking of Paul's behaviour as a model to the Christians in Thessalonica. Paul has taught them not just through his words, but through his actions. He says back in chapter 2, 3 and so on, you, you know how we lived when we were among you. Um, and he talks about his, his behaviour and his way of life, as well as his teaching and his doctrine. And Paul has been committed to praying. So if you have a look at the passage there from chapter 1, 
he says in verse 2, We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before God and before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You notice there that Paul's been thankful and he's continually praying for them. Paul is committed to praying. See it again halfway through the letter in chapter 3, and I've printed out verses 9 and 10. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we prayed most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. You see, Paul is a model of, of joyfulness. He's a model of prayerfulness and he's a model of thankfulness. And so he's encouraging them to be as he is. But it's instructive, I think, for us to have a closer look at what Paul actually prays for them here. Uh, in the italics, as uh, as we heard before, verse 23 and 24. Here is Paul's particular prayer in this chapter. He says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Paul's prayer for them is for their perseverance in the faith. And that they will persevere in holiness and blamelessness. And it's not the only time he prays these things for them. Uh, you can see it in, um, in chapter 3, I think it is, and verse 13. He says, May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Holiness and blamelessness. Come down into chapter 4. He says it's God's will that you should be sanctified. The word sanctified means made holy or declared holy. Um, God's will is that his people should be a holy people. Or down in um, verse 7. For God did not call us to be impure but to live a holy life. God's will is holiness. God's call on us is holiness. Paul's prayer for us is holiness, that we might be holy and blameless. Uh, or if we were to go outside of this letter, um, say to the Ephesians, uh, in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 1 and verse 4, it says that we were chosen in him to be holy and blameless. That's God's purpose for us. That, that's the big thing that he's doing, he's making a holy and blameless people who can live together without sin in perfect community with him, the holy God who has, no, uh, has nothing to do with sin and evil so that we can be united to him and united to each other. That's what God is doing. His Holy Spirit is producing that in our lives. And Paul's prayer is that God will do this, and then he says, for God is faithful. So he knows that as he prays to God for this, that God will do what he's promised to do. Isn't that great? That, it's a wonderful prayer that he prays for them. Um, if you're like me, sometimes you, you know that it would be a good thing to pray for somebody, but you don't quite know what to pray for. Maybe even people here at church. Well, grab a salt directory, um, find the names uh, and work your way through it, praying this, that God himself, the God of peace, will sanctify these people, that is, make them holy through and through. And may their whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you, God, that you would do this. If you're not brave enough to do that for uh, the people in the directory, pray it for the people in your home. Pray it for me, please. Pray it for one another. 
I mean, it's a great thing to be praying. In, in a way, there's nothing more significant that you could pray for another person than that God would keep them holy and blameless for eternity. You're praying that that person will be healed of everything forever. That that person will be removed from all pain, suffering, tragedy and death for eternity. That that person might share in the presence of the holy God who created and sustains and will fulfil everything. What a great prayer. I mean, the reality is that we would do well to pray the Bible for each other. I think sometimes um, it, when I think about my own prayers, and I won't talk about anybody else's, sometimes my prayers, I think, for things and for people are, are a bit like going through a fast food outlet. I'm praying Macca's type prayers or KFC type prayers, Subway prayers. I'm not, I'm not going to a place of nutrition. Of, of real substance. Now, now, the Bible says pray for everything in all circumstances. Philippians 4, in everything, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. There's nothing out of bounds when it comes to prayer. That's true. Don't hold back in talking to God about anything. Ask him for all that you need. But especially have a look at the prayers that Paul, for example, prays. And you'll see that they are prayers of deep goodness, deep nutrition, substance, eternal reality. That's what he's praying for. In fact, maybe if you are wanting to deepen your prayers, have your Bible open as you pray. Here would be a great place to start. But um, each of Paul's letters, except perhaps the Galatians one, tends to start with a prayer for them. They're also good things to be praying. Don't stop with Paul, James, Hebrews, Peter, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, right through the Bible. All kinds of stuff informing our prayers. Let me give you something to pray for. And it would be good to pray these things. This just came this afternoon, so it's hot off the press. Um, got a, a, a message that came through from Luke and Dania and Mac. Um, their little boy. They were with us here for two years. Uh, they're now in Taiwan. Um, I won't say anything more about them, uh, but let me just read you this request for prayer. Help as we navigate parenting Mac in a different culture and managing uh, the mask requirements. Pray for the particular organisation that he's working with around the world, um, that they'll have sufficient funds and uh, encouragement for a particular person in their work. Uh, asking that God will help them to find people that believe the things that they believe so that they can be encouraged by them and they can encourage them in return. Um, and to remember people who don't have access to the Father's word and are currently living without the truth uh, and ask that God will prepare their hearts and that they would seek opportunities to hear the truth. You see, here are examples around us uh, of people and opportunities for prayer. And here in Scripture, we get a focus of what to be praying for. Not only does Paul pray for them, but he encourages them to pray for him. So look at verse 25. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Now, there's not much information there, is there? Uh, what does he want them to pray for? Well, uh, if you have a look at 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2, he spells out a couple of things. It says, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured, just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. So two things there. Praying that um, through Paul, the message of the gospel will be spread and people will respond to it. And secondly, that Paul will be kept safe. Now, what you see going on here in this letter 
is a fellowship, it's a partnership, it's a sharing together in praying for each other. And it's a very important aspect of their relationship. You get three examples through the letter of specific prayers, plus you get encouragement to pray, and Paul saying the importance of prayer. I think we ought to seek opportunities whenever and wherever we can to be prayerful as brothers and sisters. And I think probably um, as a church, it's an area that we can grow in. There's been a bit of discussion in recent times about how we can promote prayer a little more at Salt Church. Uh, it could be that it's something that happens uh, before church to be encouraging you to be praying for our time together and the people who come. I know some people gather together if they're involved in the service beforehand and pray. It might be that you'd like to stay back afterwards and to pray for the things that you've heard, to pray that they will fill your life and be expressed in your behaviour and your attitudes and your words. It might be that there are particular things going on for you that you'd like prayer about and uh, we'd like to begin to offer opportunities for you just to reach out and say, I'd love it if I could pray with somebody after church at Salt. We want our salt groups to be places of, of closer Christian community where people not only study the Bible but spend time praying for each other and I would add from this perspective praying the Bible into our lives. So as we've studied a passage on a particular weeknight or whenever it is that you meet, it's great to be praying for the particular needs and and many times in all the groups I've ever been a part of, their, their health needs and other things, because they are significant, they, they matter to us, and they're pressing upon us perhaps. But maybe there's been less of the, well, what have we learnt today and how can we pray that we will put that into practice? And I think Paul's letters encourage us to move more that direction. Um, likewise, as you read the Bible, just personally, do you just read the Bible and that's it, put it to the side? Or do you take a bit of time to think how you might pray that part of the Bible into your life? God, please help me to be the generous person that I've read about here. Please help me to not be so attached to feeling like I need to be financially secure that I only give out of the the leftovers, when, you know, different things that you could be praying into your circumstances as you take time to dwell on the passage and put it into practice. Um, in fact, there are books out there on praying the Bible and uh, I think they're a great, that's a great idea. Finally, as we wrap up this letter, um, there is an expression of family affection. Um, you see it there in verse 26. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. And you'll notice that in brackets there I've put literally, greet the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. Um, I, was, I was a little bit cranky with the NIV because there's so much reference to brothers and sisters right through this letter. I don't know why they chose to translate that particular Greek word which is there as God's people. When you've got brothers and sisters in the verse above and brothers and sisters in the verse below, it's brothers and sisters. That's what it is. Anyway, enough of my griping. The focus here is on family relationships. Greet the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. The holy kiss thing, uh, well, Paul mentions it four times. Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 13. Peter mentions something similar in his letter, 1 Peter 5, the kiss of love. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Um, I take it, it, it was an expression that was normal in the cultures of the day for showing physical affection to each other as a greeting. It was, it was probably the, you know, one on each cheek type of holy kiss probably wasn't the, you know, the, yeah, anyway, the other sorts of kissing. Uh, it's, it's a holy kiss. 
because these are God's holy people gathered together. And I don't think it, it kind of captures it to, you know, have a stiff upper lip and, and, and take an English translation that greet one another with a hearty handshake. Um, but that's probably better than not greeting one another. Maybe in our culture, you know, it's, it is a, a handshake. Maybe for some relationships, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a man hug or a, or a hug and, and uh, a catch up in, you know, elbow bumps during COVID and, and knuckles and high fives and whatever it is, it's an expression of being part of the family. I don't think we need to get hung up on, you know, whether we kiss one another. It's not a job in the face, Bruce, okay? It's, uh, it's no, the fist, only a palm, no. The, uh, we, we need to be recognising that we've got relationship here. And what a privilege it is to gather with people that you're brothers and sisters with and will be for eternity. So, catch up, hang out. I think it has implications for the way that we treat one another beyond just saying g'day because the genuine affection, I think, flows over into real welcomes, genuine hospitality, real care for each other, being involved in one another's lives, connecting and, and uh, demonstrating God's love to each other in whatever ways we can.